The reason that people tend to use pine bark is a few fold, but the most important thing is that it has, and correct me if my pronunciation's wrong, it has this fabulous beneficial mold or bacteria in it called mycorrhizae. That stuff is like an inoculation, it's like a penicillin shot to pine trees to keep disease and pests out. Okay? That bark just seems to promote the production of mycorrhizae, so it's, it's super important. It also brings, it brings acid into your mix, which is important. For most stuff, you want a slightly acidic, but not too acidic, mix when it's finished. So if you were to check it with a dipstick like your pool, right, you don't want it to be crazy acidic or crazy basic. The most dangerous mix is basic. Almost nothing likes basic, okay? What brings the base in? The stones and clays tend to, okay? But we need those for good, for good drainage, right? So if you just had a bunch of earth and mixed in a little bit of bark, it would be a very rich mix. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that or that that mix is no good. What I'm saying is, you have to change your watering regimen to accommodate. And there, you run a risk, the richer your mix is, with soil and loam, compost, the, the more your risk is that you will introduce insects and disease, and that you will introduce too much humidity, too much water for too long, and you run the risk of rotting out those roots, okay? You'll find that the mix that I make, it takes a drink and it lets it go through. It really does. So you'll want to, if you're using that as a base and then morphing it to what trees you're working with and to your watering regimen, know that it stays damp for a very short time. I, the, it's intentional. I've done that on purpose. I find that it really promotes really good root growth and I find that it never allows the moisture to linger for too long, okay? When I'm working with conifers, I intentionally introduce more acid than that standard mix that I brought. Remember, I said it's just equal parts of bark, lava, hadite, which is just sedimentary stone. It's just shale, like chalkboard, old-fashioned chalkboards, that have been superheated and expands and cracks and pops like popcorn super light like lava, okay? It's also sedimentary though, so the trace elements in it are complementary to the igneous rock, right? Lava, pumice, pumice is lava. It's just the creamy, frothy part on top. So when that volcano erupts, the heavy, heavy metals settle down to the bottom because they're so heavy, and then a glass layer forms Right? And it looks, it's black, but it looks literally like glass. Then on top of that, pumice. At the very, very <coughs> top, right? It is the froth. If it was a milkshake, that's, or if it's your latte, it's the frothy top. They all come with their great attributes, and they all come with detractors. I personally don't like pumice. I know you guys just got some in. I know that there's a lot of love for it. And I, I believe the argument and I understand it. If you have a tree in a pot this size, how will you carry it around the garden, right? Or heaven forbid it's got you know four or five inches deep. I have some trees in my collection that weigh a few hundred pounds. So now you're talking a few people to move them around. It's a genius way to lighten up a heavy tree, right? Add pumice. Perlite is functional and could be used, and I understand that it's easy to get. I'm just not a fan of it. It's the stuff that looks like little plastic white floaty stuff. In fact, it does float. <laughs> My experience with it is that I used it, and I didn't enjoy it because I would have several tables like this with trees all potted up, and I'd be using my, the watering uh, wand set, set you know, to ring level, but uh, using my, uh, my garden hose, all the perlite would just come up, float, and come off onto the table and down into the, into the grass. So I just found I was losing more than I was keeping. I feel kind of the same way about pumice. It's very light, 
but I understand you're looking to lighten up the mix. So I think it's functional, right? It makes sense. It's also tricky to get, <laughs> and it can be expensive. Also remember that it is the froth, and that's why it tends to be white, or like a light, light tan color, or just slightly gray. I have seen some uh, suppliers who have like a deeper gray color, which I, I like the color of. I think, I think it has a place, if you can get it, why not use it? Lava is the only thing that I have heard almost all the experts agree upon. They don't agree upon the percentage in the mix, but they agree about the presence of it in the mix. So if you're talking to Boone in California, he'll tell you 100% lava and nothing but. But he's living in California and he's watering his trees twice a day. So for his uses, he gets the drainage that he wants, right? but he takes care of the downside. For those of us who work elsewhere, and this is a hobby, and you've got all your trees out there getting baked in the sun, I find 100% lava gets hot, especially the black, right? And it's, it's heavy, right? It's, even though it's a lighter stone, it's pretty heavy in your mix to manage to. <coughs> if you listen to a lot of the old school folks from Japan, they're huge believers in Akadama, right? Which is the clay, the big bag that's there. It's, cl it's a clay prod. And there's been a lot of debate in the bonsai world about clay products. The issue is, I call it the chips and dust issue. When you're making a nice deck for around your pool or out behind your house or something, the stairs, underneath the stairs, you want something that compacts very well and is almost like a bed of concrete so that everything, when it settles, it won't go too far. For whatever reason, clays break down so fast that they do create the chips and dust issue. And if you pull your tree out of the pot and you see that tan colored, very fine sediment compacted, the issue is your drainage holes, right? So for beginners, the most important thing about your pot is not how pretty it is or how expensive it is or where it came from. In the beginning when you're getting started, the most important thing about a bonsai pot is the drainage holes. You've got to have them and the more the better, okay? Now they probably told you guys about blocking them up. They're so big to allow as much water as they can that they would let the soil come out too. So you use something, whether it's metal, aluminum, whatever you use, but some kind of meshing, right? in there, just small, just a little bigger than the hole, to block it. But I encourage you to make sure that the mesh has pretty large caliper because you don't want it to become the way it does with a coffee percolator, right? The fine, fine filters that we use for our coffee and for our tea, they let that water drip, drip. You definitely don't want that for your bonsai. You would like it to freely just pee right up the bottom, right? When you water them or if, they're, if it's raining a lot, you want to see it come out. The reason that every bonsai pot you'll ever see has some kind of feet is you can't afford to have the bottom blocked, right? You need to have something, some kind of pedestal, some kind of space, no matter how small, to make sure that the water can come out. You'll see in some videos and in some books, if it's a rainy season in some countries and it rains a lot, the way it could here in the spring or fall, they actually just tip them all. They go along and shim them with something, just so they're up a little bit, to encourage tipping the water to one side and so that it can freely come out, okay? So if you don't, if you don't know, if you don't learn anything else today about, about pots, then I want the beginners to know that Wherever you get your pot, whether it's used, new, plastic, ceramic, make sure that it has super good drainage. Even if the holes seem awkwardly large, you can, you can accommodate with your mesh, right? But make sure you're getting that. Because between the soil that you make, whatever your mix is that you choose, and those holes, that is how you are setting up drainage. The number one problem, two, two, the number, there are two problems in my opinion that will kill trees fast. The fastest one is the sun itself without watering, 
right? July comes, 30 degrees out there, long, long days, lots of sunshine. If you don't water your trees frequently enough, they will die super fast. Some of them are more drought tolerant. You know, elms can handle a little bit more. Uh, ficus can handle a little bit longer between. Um, some tropicals, you know, uh, as well. But not watering well is, is probably the number one and the fastest way to kill a bonsai tree. A lot of people ask me, then what's the magic number? How much should you give that tree? And my answer is a crappy answer. My answer is as much as he or she needs. But I never worry about overwatering because I make sure that my pots always have big <coughs> holes, big meshes for clear drainage, and I use a mix that, that really drains well. So then I don't worry about the overwatering side. I err on the side of if I think they might need it, then I let them have it, right? I water until it comes out, right? I don't take a cup and, and just measure it. In, the, in my apartment or house, I would take it to the sink, and I would, if you have the good fortune to have a, a faucet that has a soft setting, I would get the leaves and everything wet. Don't just give it a little glass of water. Get it wet, the whole tree, the way Mother Nature would outside. They're <coughs> used to that. They respond well to that. It cleans the dust off the leaves, maybe even any little critters that might be getting in there. So don't worry about overwatering. Make sure that, that your potteries and that your media accommodate it so that you never worry about, about that, okay? Underwatering, yes, that's, that can be a tricky thing because the temperature is and how sunny and how warm it is. You know, in the winter months, once you tuck all your little maples and elms into your berm, and they're covered with a blanket of snow, we kind of forget about them, right? If you were to make the mistake of putting it in a shed to shelter it, you have to be on top of the watering because Mother Nature can't, right? You've taken it out of there. If you're keeping them in your garage near a window, which is a lovely place to shelter trees that are sensitive, you've, you've kind of got to be on top of it. Everybody seems to have a different idea of what the ideal mix is for soil, and I don't pretend to know what it is. But I've spent 30 years trying to figure out what works for me, for tropical and for outdoor stuff, and this is the closest that I have come. Okay? Well, you said that you have training people, you said about three, what's the 